The day had come. The old scientist's nightmare was now a reality. Hello, skipper. Hello, navigator. Half a minute to go. Okay. Uh, hello, engineer. Skipper here. Yeah. Will you put the ramps up, please? Yeah. On a spring night in 1944, a sortie of 244 Lancaster bombers, Britain's shining sword, set their sights on his city, Munich. Among their targets is the city's central railway station. A lot of searchlights and fighter players, Skipper. Yeah, leave on. Okay, boys, okay. Hello, Bombardier. Okay when you are. Bomb doors open. Bomb doors open, Bombardier. Bomb's going in a minute. By sunrise, the railway and its surrounding switchyards are reduced to a smoldering patchwork of flames and twisted metal. But such aerial bombardments aren't defined by their accuracy and are as much feared for their strategic effectiveness as for the randomness of the devastation. 7,000 buildings surrounding the railway burn. The paleontologist, now at the end of his long career, receives word of the attack from his family castle in Nuremberg, and though it's unclear how or when he learned this, he would eventually discover that sometime after midnight, a stray bomb landed directly on his museum, gutting its innards and pulverizing its contents, including his life's work, all of his dinosaurs. But they were the least of his losses. It's definitely going down now. Good, Jimmy, I can see it, boy. Good show. It's January, 1911 and Ernst Fryer Stromer von Reichenbach, or Ernst Stromer, as we'll call him, is 64 days into his expedition, well on his way to becoming a desert creature. This small man is obsessed with a huge problem. Was it Africa, he asks, rather than Europe or Asia, as his colleagues hold, that the earliest mammals blossomed into being? This image depicts a more hardened and dissatisfied version of the 40-year-old that first set foot on the docks of Alexandria. And now, after months of failure, his situation is dire. This locale holds his last hope of finding something amazing. But just as he and his Egyptian companions settle into camp, black clouds swallow the desert. A sandstorm follows close behind. Between bickering with the crew in his broken Arabic and shivering in the cold, Stromer's only refuge is his flea-infested sleeping bag. Over the next few days, when he's not fighting to keep the winds from tearing his tent out of the earth and into the sky, all he can do is reflect on the past two months, the most difficult and eventful months of his life. When the ports of Alexandria first came into view from the deck of the steamship he boarded in Italy, Stromer had grand plans for the coming journey. The names of the people he was to meet, the times his train would leave its station, exact dates and grand expectations flooded his orderly mind. But troubles began before he set foot in the country. He spent the nights lying awake stricken with seasickness and the days absorbing verbal abuse from a colleague that snuck his crabby wife along. Despite being born to a wealthy family, Stromer's own pockets never seemed to run very deep, and this trip was to depend on a paltry, shoestring budget. Just as he thought he was going to feel the relief of dry land beneath his trembling feet, the ship went into lockdown. Convinced that a sick passenger had cholera, the captain quarantined the vessel. A day and a half passed, before they set foot on Egyptian soil. The trio took a train south to the crowded, chaotic, and bustling capital, Cairo. There, Stromer did his best to show the couple the sights and sounds of the ancient city, introducing them to the great European scientists and explorers of the age. But the snobbish pair were unimpressed. If Cairo could be called dull, Stromer politely warned, then the Sahara that awaited them was a hell on earth. They abandoned Stromer, and half of his supplies left with them. From there, he frantically crisscrossed Cairo, collecting permits and meeting colleagues. But his checklist couldn't be complete without his desert companion. Richard Markgraf's fluency, both in Arabic and in the ways of the Sahara, made him indispensable. But Stromer couldn't seem to find him. On the verge of giving up, the scientist was relieved when he inserted the key into the door of his hotel room only to find Richard Markgraf sitting inside, waiting. A portrait of the man survives, 
which betrays a face for which the sun held no mercy. His caring eyes burrowed deeply in their sockets. His cheeks and forehead furrowed far beyond his years. His cracked lips buried in the wiry beard of a wild man. What little is known of Markgraf, a man of Czech descent that spent his impoverished adult life in Egypt, is that he possessed an incredible capacity for hard work, as well as an unmatched ability to find and collect important fossils. The German knew this better than anyone, as Markgraf was responsible for finding some of those toothy, prehistoric whales that served as a foundation of the studies that built his reputation. The journey was to be comprised of three phases. First, they were to search for early mammal fossils in a valley west of Cairo. But after working tirelessly for weeks, they had little to show for it. Stromer left early to plan for the next phase, leaving Markgraf behind to carry on. When they met again a week later, Markgraf placed in his boss's hands the skull of a small monkey. Stromer named the species Libipithecus Markgrafi after his friend. Then, they turned their attention south, near the ancient ruins at Luxor, where the two men, a few camels and an Egyptian cook, explored a steaming sea of outcrop east of the Nile. This time, it was Margraf that left early. Working in isolation day after day, Stromer was rewarded in divine panoramic views and hazy red sunsets, but not in fossils. Humbled, he caught a train back to Cairo. There, he opened a disastrous letter. Markgraf, one to suffer from bouts of violent sickness, would be unable to weather the third and final phase. And monkeys aside, the expedition had so far, in the way of fossils at least, been a failure. And now, Stromer was without his most vital ally. Desperate to fill his place, Stromer hired an entirely Egyptian team of cooks, guides, and camel drivers. The X on his map was a poorly known section of the western desert some 370 kilometers west of Cairo, called the Bahariya. The miniature caravan set out for their long Saharan slog. In the evenings, when the winter chill proved intolerable, Stromer dismounted and walked beside the camels to conjure heat from his chattering body. After a week of marching, they arrive and become bogged down first by rain and then by a surge of stinging sand. But now, after days of turmoil, the desert grows silent Scrambling around the sandstone slopes, Stromer keeps his eyes wide for fossils. The next few days are exhausting. He finds fossils of sharks, fish, crocodiles, and some bits and bobs of reptilian sea-going plesiosaurs. Nothing extraordinary, but something. These convince him that the Baharia is Cretaceous in age, something previous geologists had speculated. Though precise ages were unknowable to him, where the numbers stand today, the Baharia and its fossils seem to be between 95 and 100 million years old. All this time, something has been calling to him. Like an all-seeing eye, a 500-foot hill towers over this Martian landscape. Entranced, he leads the party in its direction. Surrounding this wind-carved cathedral of stone are weathered bone chips, pieces of crocs and sharks scattered about. But as the German scans the hill in the tower's shadow, his heart sinks, and no matter how vigorously he rubs his eyes with his mouth ajar in silent disbelief, these mirages refuse to vanish. The gigantic bones sprawled out before him are very real. At his feet are, quote, three large bones which I attempt to excavate and photograph. His search image, attuned to picking out the tiny, shrewish remains of mammals, is now swamped by objects thousands of times more massive. No expert in fossil reptiles, he can still recognize that huge bones of land-living creatures found in Cretaceous rocks can mean only one thing. Apparently, he writes, these are the first of Egypt's dinosaurs. Parts of a pelvis, spinal column, and even a hooked claw are among the day's thrills. But giant bones pose giant problems, and Stromer is at a loss to properly retrieve and transport them. He collects what he can before retiring to his tent, where he scribbles into his journal while the chattering of jackals fill the desert. Then he does the unthinkable. He abandons the site, his only promising lead in two months of prospecting. As they soldier forth, they pass chunks of jagged dinosaurs, huge limb bones poking through the desert floor like compound fractures in the Earth's crust. 
They vacuum up bits of fish and marine reptiles in their path, but supplies are thinning. By its end, this journey was surely the most exhausting thing he had ever done. As he starts back to the city, he's beaming, at least on the inside. He's tapped into a new world of dinosaurs, fish, and reptiles, a lost paradise. But Egypt is harsh, and he's not built for the work. Even before leaving for the Baharia, he wrote, I am too frail for such expeditions. I substitute tenacity and flexibility for the strength and pluck that I lack. Never again does Stromer see the land of the pharaohs. But Margraf, living in the western desert and always hungry for work, was born for the job. From 1912 to 1914, he works alone in the Baharia. A steady stream of new discoveries, which we'll meet later, are brought to light through the partnership. Margraf the field man and Stromer the scientist. But tensions between Germany and Britain are rising. British officials in Egypt, which was then a protectorate of the crown, now claim all shipments bound for Germany as their own. Markgraf panics, as Stromer can't pay him until he has the fossils. But as of July 28, 1914, when the Great War begins, it seems that nothing could free their treasures. But in 1916, British authorities have a change of heart. Margraf fell ill, as he often did over the course of his short life, and died, leaving his wife penniless. Per Stromer's pleadings, British authorities gift her a lump sum and offer to house the fossils, all 12 cases of them. Though Stromer would not see the specimens for another eight years, or his friend ever again, Markgraf's work was to provide him with decades worth of fertile research. Four years earlier, in 1912, while Markgraf's brow dripped with sweat in the Egyptian sun, Stromer's was wrinkled in concentration. The latest shipment contained a set of alien remains. In Stromer's care were a dozen vertebrae, some ribs, a set of prodigious lower jaws, and more than a dozen conical teeth. The specimen was incomplete, and through Markgraf, Stromer understood that it was in a sorry state to begin with. As he writes, many of the bones had already been broken and deformed in the sediment. Furthermore, the remains were completely jumbled the skull seems to have originally been present, but due to its exposed position, had been almost completely eroded away. Two things must have been striking about the skeleton. First, each back vertebra rooted a tower of bone, the longest of which stood a full six feet high. These spines stitched into a spectacular fin atop the animal's back. The function of this sail, as it's called, is a mystery to Stromer, and it's been a mystery ever since. Countless hypotheses, some plausible, others less so, have been advanced to explain it in the last hundred years. We'll address this mystery in another episode, where we'll discover what this monstrosity was like as a living, breathing animal. Just as impressive is the animal's overall size. His measurements are almost hard to believe. Some context. By 1900, the previous century's influx of sauropod dinosaurs that collection of long-necked, long-tailed, earth-shaking species from the much older Jurassic rocks of the American West, some of which pushed more than 20 tons in weight, had cemented the idea of reptilian behemoths in the minds of scientists and the world. And where there is flesh, there are flesh seekers. It was logical, therefore, to predict that the largest animals to walk the earth were fed upon by predators of appropriate stature. And they were. Allosaurus, then the largest terrestrial carnivore known to have lived, weighed as much as three huge brown bears. But deposits from the younger Cretaceous period had an unholy surprise in store. Expeditions into Montana and Wyoming at the beginning of the 20th century produced the remains of a carnivore that had to be seen to be believed. In the course of our evolution, human beings have feared, fled, and grappled with predators. The bears, crocs and cats with which we have shared landscape. There exists a reservoir of deep genetic memory that perpetuates our awareness of and fear for large carnivores. So the existence of a butcher as sizable and powerful as this one, as vulgar a shock to its discoverers as it was to polite society, was as unforeseeable as the atomic bomb. It was a monster that seemed more likely to be feasting on souls in Bosch's depiction of hell than stalking prey in the jungles of history. 
it would take nine of some of the largest bears alive or three and a half Allosaurus to match the conservative mass estimates for this ultra predator. At the turn of the 20th century, the fact that colossal but peaceful leaf eaters were inhabiting the distant past was safely understood. But ever since being reintroduced to the wild as Tyrannosaurus rex in 1905, this killer has stalked the jungles of the human mind. Seven years after that name was first uttered, Stromer opens a shipping crate containing the colossal but fractured and incomplete skeleton of a sail-backed theropod from Egypt, thereby bearing witness to the world's second such ultra predator. But aside from providing measurements of individual bones and simply referring to the animal as large, Stromer, a man of understatements, declines to reiterate or emphasize this fact in his study. I imagine him taking quiet, personal delight in finding that his animal may well have exceeded even the 40-foot T-Rex in total length. He concludes his 1915 description by gifting a name to the beast. He writes that, quote, the establishment of a new genus and species is certainly justified, which I name according to its most conspicuous character, the spinous process of the trunk vertebrae, and after the land of origin, Spinosaurus aegypticus. Some have accused him of showing a lack of creativity for this name, but I think it's only when you're sharing a lexicon with a name like Tyrannosaurus rex, the tyrannical king of reptiles, that Spinosaurus aegypticus could sound benign by comparison. The man responsible for naming Tyrannosaurus was Henry Fairfield Osborne, paleontologist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. As remains of the Tyrant King were being extracted from the rock, drawings of a fully assembled rex towering over a human were produced under his direction. Before anyone had ever seen a mounted T-Rex in person, these put the size of this ultra predator in perspective for the first time. And almost 20 years after naming it, Stromer creates just such a drawing for his Spinosaurus in Osbornean tradition. In 1936, the world got its first taste of a restored Spinosaurus skeleton, the second flavor of Ultra Predator. Stromer was liberal enough to infer the shapes of missing bones from other theropods, but despite the slender jaws, he was too conservative to give it anything other than a blocky Allosaurus-like skull. In his survey of theropod dinosaurs, the legendary Friedrich von Huhn said what Stromer was too polite to say himself. Upon comparing Osborne's measurements to those of Stromer's dinosaur, Huhn declared that Spinosaurus may have been the largest beast of prey there ever was. Another thing that stood out to Stromer, and what's worth remembering for our purposes, is that the teeth were distinct from all other theropods. They're straight, cone-shaped to the extreme, and while other theropods have serrations, tiny ridges like those on a steak knife, Spinosaurus teeth lacked those altogether. People often compare T-Rex teeth to railroad spikes because of their thick, cross-sectional roundness, but that's a comparison for which Spinosaurus is far more worthy, as its deeply rooted teeth could hardly be said to curve at all. Evolution had honed these teeth to seize and grip prey, not to shear or dice it. Under the circumstances, Stromer does an exceptional job. Given such alien spines, slender jaws, and straightened, unserrated teeth, traits totally unique among theropods, it's a testament to his skill as an anatomist that he manages to recognize it as a dinosaur at all. Unlike Baryonyx, though, Spinosaurus fails to steal the eyes of the world. When the first mounted skeleton of Tyrannosaurus rex went up in New York in 1915, it set the headlines ablaze. When Stromer named Spinosaurus that year, it did nothing of the sort, because it was 1915, and Europe was mad. And for the millions, then fighting for their lives in the inferno along Europe's front lines, in the putrid trenches of France, high in Italy's shivering Alps, or in the fly-choked Dardanelles, their world really was on fire. Word of a curious set of bones from Egypt was lost in the shock of ceaseless shelling and rifle fire.
After the war, most of Margraf's fossils were still in the belly of the Geological Survey of Egypt. Though the authorities had held on to the crates, they proved unwilling to relinquish them. But pressure from Stromer's peers proved annoying enough for British authorities to finally grant their release. But Stromer, financially crippled by Germany's inflation crisis, couldn't afford to pay for the deliverance of the specimens. It was then that an old student of his, now an established zoologist, stepped forward to personally pay the huge shipping cost. In 1922, eight years after having been collected, the fossils arrive at his door. But authorities back in Egypt hadn't been kind to the parcels. The bones had been toyed with and haphazardly repackaged, leaving them in crumbled disrepair. But Stromer and Margraf had worked too hard, had invested too much money, too much life force for him to give up now. The scientist patiently dedicated the next few years to reassembling the fossils, to working through impossible puzzles of bone chips. And the results were astonishing. Spinosaurus did not live in a vacuum, but a hugely rich ecosystem teeming with life. In the 1920s and 30s, Stromer is describing new species left and right. Among his dinosaurs are vertebrae and limbs from a new species of long-necked sauropod that he calls Egyptosaurus bahariensis in 1932. Amazingly, Stromer didn't have just one ultra predator, but three. In 1934, he describes a partial skeleton of a massive, if mysterious, theropod that he names Bahariosaurus ingens. The appearance and evolutionary history of this animal remain shrouded in mystery to this day. He also announces his awesomely named Carcharodontosaurus saharicus, the shark-toothed reptile of the Sahara. Numerous teeth, as well as large portions of this dinosaur's hind limbs, pelvis, and skull are preserved, allowing for a thorough description. Also present are numerous remains of fish, including the fossils of an extinct sawfish called Onchopristus. Present, too, were several wonderful crocs. Stomatosuchus, bigger than any living saltwater crocodile, possessed a skull as flat as a pancake and a lower jaw entirely devoid of teeth. Its life habits remain unclear. Smaller and cuter is Libicosuchus, puppy-sized and agile. This was one of the many prehistoric crocs that would have been more at home on land than in the water. Lovely and strange kinds of turtles, snakes, and marine plesiosaurs also filled the waters of Bahariya. Through a series of richly illustrated, magnificently detailed monographs, Stromer does something that few human beings ever get the chance to do. He gives life to a forgotten corner of planet Earth, a miniature world lost in the swells of time. By age 60, Stromer had become the head of the paleontology department at the prestigious Bavarian State Collection of Paleontology and Historical Geology. A few years later, in 1934, another man is awarded a promotion. A 45-year-old Austrian named Adolf Hitler becomes the chancellor and the face of Germany. And the rest is history. But where does that leave us with Stromer? On the surface, Stromer seemed to fit Hitler's mold perfectly. He's what he would have called a racially pure Aryan, with a Germanic pedigree that stretched back to the Middle Ages. He was a victim of the same socio-economic collapse that left him and the German populace poor and embittered after the Great War. And now, he's faced with an ambitious new leader, promising a path to restore German honor and pride through a tidal wave of nationwide enthusiasm. Still, this 65-year-old despised the Nazi regime. Under the crushing weight of a monstrous social pressure, he stood tall, as a steadfast and vocal opponent of Hitler's agenda. Perhaps it was his taste of the First World War, some 20 years earlier, first as a nurse treating the wounded and later as a military geologist, that had left him skeptical of mindless nationalism. But now, under the Reich's racially based Nuremberg laws, his most heinous sin is his refusal to shun Jewish friends and colleagues. If any German could be said to have been in a good position to speak out, it was Stromer. He belonged to a family of aristocrats, upstanding and productive citizens of the city of Nuremberg for 500 years, where his own father had served as mayor. Germans like Stromer were the last people the Nazis wanted to hound, so he savored some protections, at least for a while. Amidst Hitler's soaring popularity, two events must have particularly troubled Stromer. The first occurred on September 1st, 1939, 
when the German military invaded Poland and the tenuous web of lies and useless political dams that had been staving off World War for years finally crumbled. Thirty years earlier, during his third and final expedition to Egypt, Stromer was introduced to the daughter of a colleague, whom he later married in Germany, as another total war, again with Germany at its center, threatened to plunge Europe into chaos. Stromer must have feared deeply for their three young sons. The next troublesome event was more local. In 1940, the director of the Bavarian State Natural History Collections, a friend of Stromer's named Ferdinand Bro Lilly, retired. His replacement was Karl Bjorlin, a young, energetic paleontologist and devout Nazi. It goes without saying that Stromer and Bjorlin were less than chummy. By 1944, at the peak of his savage global war, Hitler had a long list of questionable tactical decisions to answer for. With an allied land invasion imminent, with Russian hordes mobbing ferociously from the east, thirsting for revenge, and as metal flocks of British and American bombers were delivering payloads of hellish incendiaries over German cities with ruthless regularity, Stromer grew uneasy. Numerous towns, villages, and cities had felt such aerial kisses, and many thousands of civilians were dead. Not even Berlin was safe, as the bombing campaign had, by then, left more than one and a half million people without homes. At this moment, though, Munich had, so far, been spared. But to many, these other attacks were merely a presage of destruction. It was only a matter of time, it was feared, before the wretched buzz of swarming engines would thunder across Munich's sky. Stromer knew in his core that if the museum collections were to be saved, action had to be taken at once. But when he raised these concerns to Bjorlin, he was chastised for it. To worry about the war effort was, to this Nazi, something only a defeatist could admit. The way Bjorlin saw things, there was no greater cause than that of the Third Reich. And if Germany were to lose the war, the museum collections would be worthless anyway. Amidst rumors that other German institutions were evacuating art and science collections to the safety of basements, salt mines, and even caves, Bjorlin presiding over the grandest natural history collection in Central Europe, had the final say. And as Stromer's pleadings became increasingly desperate, he only dug his heels in deeper. Twice, Bjorlin warned the old man that he had the power to have him sent to a concentration camp. Stromer wasn't alone in his angst. Some curators took matters into their own hands and managed to sneak much of the museum's zoology collections to safety. Bro Lilly, personally hid a number of smaller fossils in his briefcase and delivered them to the castle of a fossil-loving princess north of the city. But no matter how much he felt for the man, Bro Lilly could not fit his friend's dinosaurs into a briefcase. Across the English Channel, Munich was a target of growing interest for the Allies. of April 24th, 1944, Stromer's fears are realized. His one-of-a-kind collection of Egyptian fossils were smashed to powder. But Stromer was growing numb to such blows. It's been suggested that the decision to place his two oldest sons into units that would face some of the most vicious combat was a deliberate form of indirect punishment. Practically the instant they were drafted, his two oldest, Ullmann and Wolfgang, were thrown into the grips of a frigid, war-torn Russia to face the Soviets. Ullmann, his oldest, was the first to die, killed in combat in 1941. Seven months after the raid on Munich, his middle child, Wolfgang, vanished on the Eastern Front. And exactly one year after the bombings, his youngest, 18-year-old Gerard, was killed, fighting the Allies in northern Germany. Two weeks later, the war in Europe was over. Stromer was the model for what good science is, cautious, self-aware, and precise. He was, as an admirer of his once wrote, a man with a mind that judged without prejudice, inclined to argument almost by principle. It's especially sad to consider the qualities that served him so well as a scientist were ultimately what cost him the most. But there was a break in the clouds. Wolfgang, who'd gone missing in Russia and was feared dead, was back among the living, 
His physics background was grounds for his Soviet captors to demand that he help concoct chemical weapons for Stalin. When he failed to comply, he was exiled to labor in a series of Siberian gulags. After more than five years, a sentence that must have felt like a thousand, he was freed in 1950. Just in time, too, as when Wolfgang came home, his father was now in his 80th year. It was as if Stromer had kept himself alive through sheer willpower. Now satisfied that his son was safe and expecting his first child, Stromer allowed death to greet him at the family castle in Nuremberg in 1952. He was 82 years old. While Stromer was respected in his lifetime, his contributions were largely forgotten after his death. Most classic dinosaur books written over the next few decades make no mention of him, Margraf, or the Bahariya fossils. Citations are the currency of academia. Without a steady stream of them, one's work can quickly fade into the background. Stromer's publications were of little use to those busy working on the different, more accessible dinosaurs spilling out of rocks across western North America and Asia. Spinosaurus the animal vanished from the earth after perhaps a million years of incremental environmental change, but it vanished again after just three decades contact with humanity, making it one of the few species to go extinct twice. In the decades following the war, Spinosaurus remained an island in the theropod family tree, a loner without relatives. Occasionally it lived a second life in picture books or dinosaur encyclopedias, invariably pictured as a colossal, sail-backed clone of Allosaurus. But with no tangible remains in existence, it was in a kind of limbo, one step between the mythical realm of the Yeti or the Griffin and the world of observable, concrete zoology. Some would come to question its very existence as an animal, asking if it were not some chimera of multiple skeletons mistakenly confused to be one. But it was real. Finds elsewhere in the Sahara, in Europe, Asia, and South America, were waiting to prove it. And they're waiting for us in the next episode.